Hey guys, welcome back. So in this video, I'm going to react to the Med School Insider's So You Want to Be an Anesthesiologist video. So I just want to thank you guys for watching my videos. I want to remind you to like the video. Don't forget, uh, just click that thumbs up right now. Um, and it will help the algorithm pick up the video so more people can see this and get inspired to become an anesthesiologist like you are. So don't forget, go ahead and click that like. So this particular video was produced by Med School Insiders, which I think is a great resource for pre-meds that are interested in different specialties or med students that are currently training and are interested in getting into a residency program and want to know more about that specialty. I think this is a great channel. So I'll leave a link to this video from their channel below so you guys can take a look at it. This is going to be a reaction to their video, So You Want to Be an Anesthesiologist. And this reaction video was done at the suggestion of someone in the comment section. And I think that it's a good idea for me to kind of show you my perspective on the things that they're saying here as it pertains to my particular journey to becoming an anesthesiologist. So you want to be an anesthesiologist. You like the idea of being in the operating room, being the patient's guardian angel, and having a laid back lifestyle. Let's debunk the public perception myths of what it means to be an anesthesiologist and give it to you straight. This is the reality of anesthesiology. Dr. Jabal, so far, I'm in total agreement. So the specialty of anesthesiology is one that definitely interests many people who are into doing things with their hands. They are very skilled with you know, hands-on activities and um, that's one of their strong points and as was mine. And also, you know, someone who wants to be in the operating room and have an active role but doesn't necessarily want to be doing surgery or living the lifestyle of a surgeon. So I totally agree with that. Those are the main reasons why I in particular got into this specialty as well. And then the last part about lifestyle, yeah, that's there, but we'll get into that a little bit more. We'll be doing a day in the life of an anesthesiologist. Anesthesiology is the specialty dealing with taking care of patients before, during, and after surgery, or in other words, pre-op, intra-op, and post-op. Think of them as the patient's guardian angel, or the one responsible for making sure the patient gets through surgery safely. In addition to insurance. So the guardian angel phrase is, I think, very appropriate. It's something that you're going to be considered when you're an anesthesiologist for sure. But I think like a patient advocate, that's one that I use most frequently when I'm describing my specialty or when I'm teaching med students in the OR. So your role is to advocate for your patient to really become their voice because they can't speak at the time when they're under your, your anesthetic. They're not able to respond. They're not able to really voice their opinion or their concern. So you're supposed to you know, fill that role as their doctor and make sure that all of the things that you think the patient would want, you know, to be promoted as far as their safety is promoted while they're having surgery. In addition to ensuring patients are properly sedated and comfortable throughout the operation, they also maintain stable vitals, hemodynamic status, meaning their blood circulation, and an open airway to ensure adequate breathing. So yes, definitely hits the nail on all of your major responsibilities in the OR. So you're gonna be, of course, putting patients to sleep, making them unconscious, and giving them medications that will make them less likely to have pain after surgery. But in addition to that, most people don't know that anesthesiologists are there to make sure the vitals are being watched. And we watch them closely throughout the procedure. We actually have monitors that are set up with many alarms that help you know when the vitals are not at a normal range and um, so that you can respond quickly and fix those problems as the patient is undergoing their surgery. So it's a constant watch or vigilance that you're required to have when you're an anesthesiologist. And actually that's the, the motto for our society, um, you know, is maintenance of vigilance and being fully aware of what's going on with your patient throughout the entirety of their surgery. So that's something that you should be able to do if you want to get into this field. You should also be very good at paying attention to details for that same reason. And the other thing I wanted to comment on was the airway, maintenance of the airway. So that is something that I actually 
really love and um, is a part of my job description from day to day. So I am the director of the airway management rotation for our residency. And so in that realm, I actually do, as an anesthesiologist, really provide education on how to manage airways, how to intubate with many different devices and what to do whenever there is a difficult airway and it becomes challenging to place to intubate or place a breathing tube in a patient. So what are your other options? What are some things that you can do? So as an anesthesiologist, I wanna emphasize that part because we are considered the masters of airway management or we have mastered airway management as a part of our training. And to maintain vitals in a stable and consistent manner, what they call railroad tracks. Patients are also unable to breathe on their own during surgery, so an anesthesiologist places a breathing tube called an endotracheal tube connected to a ventilator. Pre-op, the anesthesiologist will see the patient to make sure they are safe to proceed with surgery, ensuring their medical conditions are stable and they haven't recently smoked, eaten, or drank anything since the previous day. So, as far as the pre-op course goes, we are the... I want to say the guardian part of guardian angel really comes out here because um, we need to ensure that patients are safe and healthy enough to undergo surgery. And if at the time of pre-op there is any concerning situation with the medical history or let's say specifically, for example, the patient ate within a couple of hours of surgery or more recently than that, we have to pause the surgery, delay it sometimes even cancel it. And that I think is what makes us out to be a little bit of a, less of an angel in the eyes of a surgeon. So, I mean, we're there to promote the safety of patients. And if there's any reason that we think that a surgery will not proceed safely, we're supposed to be empowered to say our piece and advocate for our patient and make sure that things aren't going to go forward until it is as safe as possible. So that is going to be your job if you're an anesthesiologist. And that's probably one of the hardest parts of your job as an anesthesiologist, in my opinion. Otherwise, they could aspirate during surgery, meaning regurgitate and choke on their stomach contents. Intra-op, they'll be taking care of the patient, and post-op, they'll ensure safe recovery and pain management. Contrary to stereotypes, anesthesiology isn't just about putting people to sleep and then doing crossword puzzles. Sure, there are- <laughs> So, that's something I get all the time, you know, um, are anesthesiologists in the room the entire time? Or is it possible to just like give them the medicine, put them to sleep, and then like not watch what's going on or walk away or come back when it's done? And in this example, he says that um, the thought is that, you know, we put people to sleep and then we do crossword puzzles. That, I'm gonna say, is actually, it's kind of like, you know, me with this experience of, of having an, a car that can do autopilot, it's kind of the same thing, right? So if your car can drive itself, that's great but it's always expected, recommended, like this is what you should be doing, is being vigilant throughout. Even if your car is, has a fun functional ability to drive itself, you shouldn't go to sleep. Like why would you do that? Or, you know, read a book while the car is driving. It's, all these things are machines and they're computers and they require human interaction and human judgment to make them work at the best possible functionality. So things could happen suddenly and the car or the machine will alarm and someone needs to be there to fix it. Someone needs to be there to interact with that patient and to fix the problems that are occurring um, because that's not possible for the ventilator and that's not possible for the autopilot vehicle. You need a person there, you need someone with skills and judgment capabilities. So yeah, though people do take their eyes off the screen from time to time, may check their phone, may read something else during that time frame. It is not what our expectations are in the war. So there's that. Are moments of downtime as an anesthesiologist, but even when things are calm and steady, it requires constant vigilance to anticipate any potential problems. And when things go sideways, they really hit the fan and it's all hands on deck. This is not a specialty for those who aren't able to handle high intensity situations. So I want to underscore that last part. So this specialty, like I said, is something that requires vigilance. So you're constantly watching as 
you may understand at this point <laughs> that you have to be very much aware of what's going on and ready to respond to an emergency. So if you're in the OR and things are smooth sailing and you're like, okay, this case is going to go great, straightforward, you know, kind of just relax a little bit in your chair. Then you all of a sudden hear the heart rate pick up or you hear the alarm from your machine um, or your monitor telling you that the blood pressure has dropped really like significantly from the last one. What are you gonna do? What do you, how do you respond? So your residency training is gonna teach you all of these ways to respond. All these will hopefully show you these possible scenarios and train you in ways to respond to them. So that's why it's a four year residency um, so that you can learn what to do when things go south and how to respond in the quickest, safest manner. So he's right. It's all good until it's not good. And that's what you're going to be learning how to deal with when you're a resident. So as a part of your training, you're going to learn how to manage people that are crashing, people who are going into like a state of shock or having a massive blood loss all of a sudden or who are having heart attack while they're having anesthesia. Um, you're going to learn how to deal with all those things and um, you're gonna get adjusted and acquainted to responding appropriately in a, in a state of emergency. You're gonna learn how to keep your cool when the situation becomes stressful and you're gonna learn how to respond quickly, okay? Because that is part of the job. So being skillful with your hands is great when things are smooth, but when things get very crazy in the OR, you need to know how to do what you've been trained to do under duress. So that's part of the training and that's actually something that I think we look at for a good characteristic of resident. So someone who looks like they can manage that stress and who would handle it appropriately. And quick clinical judgment. You can think of anesthesiology in a few different categories. First, academic versus community versus private practice. As an academic anesthesiologist, you'll be working at a large hospital associated with a medical school. In addition to your regular clinical duties, you'll also be responsible for teaching medical students and residents. You may also be involved with anesthesiology related research. So that is really pretty on point as far as the description of what the job duties are and responsibilities are when you're an academic anesthesiologist. So this is actually exactly what I do at my current job. Um, which is an academic center. So it's a large facility. It's a level one trauma center and we are responsible for clinical duties. So taking care of patients, having surgery in the OR on a regular daily basis. And in addition to that, we are responsible for teaching residents. So we teach residents, we teach med students most specifically. And in our residency education, we give different types of teaching. So we do lectures, we do simulations, and we do different other um, formal training in the OR. So we're teaching throughout our days. So lastly, the research component, that is something that if you are interested in academic anesthesiology or any academic medicine or working in an academic medical center period, you're gonna be involved in or presented with opportunities to involve yourself in research. And that is what will propel the field forward um, and provide new insights to other people who are learning. And as medicine is a practice, this is something that really pushes forward education. If you're someone who enjoys teaching and wants to get involved in research, then an academic practice is for you. As a private practice anesthesiologist, you'll be working at privately owned hospitals or clinics where your day will also consist of more routine cases. Private practice and community practice are generally just strictly clinical OR work and don't include teaching and research. It's usually higher compensation than academia, but some do find this more monotonous. So in regards to the last part of it, the routine cases, um, or like we typically call it elective cases, um, those are mostly again done in these settings of community and private practice. When the conversation was mentioned, I was thinking this is a great point to stop because most specifically, in the current situation of the pandemic and at the very beginning of the pandemic about a year ago the elective cases that were being done were put on pause um, so no one was doing any of that and it basically wiped clean the slate for a lot of these private practice locations community hospital locations for cases that were going into the OR so as you can imagine 
with the compensation being tied to the cases you do, that really led to a very unstable financial situation for many. And it caused people to really question, you know, their involvement in the field. You know, is there anything else they could do? That was a point of reflection for, I think, a lot of people. And um, in contrast, in the academic center, we specifically were not that affected as far as having the question of job stability because it's an area where there are more patients that are chronically there. We were centers where people were being cared for in the ICU throughout the entire pandemic. There was a utility for anesthesiologists throughout this whole crisis. And I was very thankful, very blessed that my job remained stable throughout that time frame. But that's something that private practice doesn't really provide, though yes, it may provide you with higher compensation and you know, um, you can take that, that money can be earned um, pretty quickly, but it's really all about eating what you kill and getting paid for the cases that you do. So if you don't work, you don't get paid. If you're more in an academic setting, your salary is based upon, yes, your clinical cases, but teaching residents amongst other responsibilities, which really does make for a more stable employment model, in my opinion. So I say all that to say that when you're thinking about where you want to work, private versus academic. There are pros and cons for either employment model and you really want to strongly consider what will work most for you. So I think that this is a really important piece for people to make their decision on where they'd like to work. So I'm actually going to do a video on this topic alone, the pros and cons of private versus academic practice in the video to come. So please stay tuned to my channel for that. Colleges are typically in the operating room or OR but depending on your type of practice, you may be working in other parts of the hospital. For example, critical care anesthesiologists manage patients in the intensive care unit, or ICU. Chronic pain anesthesiologists see patients in clinic rather than the hospital who suffer from chronic pain. This involves prescribing various pain medications or administering injections. After completing medical school, anesthesiology residency is an additional four years. So, as was mentioned, there are very many places that you can work as an anesthesiologist and I completely um, enjoyed the breakdown that he did where he showed, um, you know, the different specialties that are mostly outside of the OR. So critical care anesthesiologists or anesthesiology doctors that work in the ICU or uh, chronic pain specialists or pain management specialists who usually work outside of the OR in a clinic setting or can work in conjunction with the hospital taking care of patients that have chronic pain issues and providing procedural interventions for pain, so pain interventions. So those are two very easy to reference ways that you can go forth with anesthesiology without having to work in an operating room all day long. So all of the specialties of anesthesiology, those are, you know, being in these areas that were mentioned, have to deal with an additional one-year fellowship training and that training also involves another exam so that you can become highly specialized and highly equipped to take care of patients in these categories of critical care, chronic pain, acute pain, obstetrics, neuroanesthesiology, etc. The first year or intern year is a standard intern year where you rotate through a variety of specialties. Your actual anesthesia training begins during your second year of residency or PGY2, meaning postgraduate year two. We call this second year of residency, which is the first year of anesthesiology training as CA1, standing for clinical anesthesia year. So as a PGY2, you'll be a CA1. There are two types of residency programs, categorical and advanced. For categorical programs, you'll do all four years at the same institution in an integrated program. The first year, or intern year, can be either a medicine year or a surgical year, or even a mix of the two. I did want to comment when I watched this video, I wanted to comment on this part of it. So the training program for anesthesiology does involve four years. And as he mentioned, you can do an intern year in either medicine or surgery. Um, a lot of intern years are pretty comprehensive and you rotate through many specialties, but I think the medicine and the surgery part are the key ones because you need to really get acquainted with, um, of course, if you're doing anesthesiology, the OR. So if you're doing surgery, 
as an intern and learning all the ways that patients are cared for in the perioperative period, it does help you. But then also just keeping in mind that you're gonna be working with the same surgeons, learning from them. And your intern year will really help you understand, you know, things that they prefer, things that they're typically going to do. So that will help you when you're an anesthesiology resident. So I think that's a really key part of your intern year. And then medicine is going to be crucial to your foundation as well. A lot of internships are heavily based in medicine and I think that that really helps you as an anesthesiologist to become very strong in understanding physiology, understanding different um, comorbidities or different diseases that accompany a patient's need for surgery as well. So you really do learn a lot about that and it builds a great foundation and that's why it's really essential for part of your training in anesthesiology. In terms of competitiveness, anesthesiology used to be highly competitive two decades ago. These days, it's one of the least competitive specialties, second only to family medicine, as we've outlined in our six least competitive specialties video. The average step one score is 232, and the average step two CK score is 244. But the high number of programs and positions means there are several unfilled positions each year. So anesthesia as a specialty and um, com competitiveness really changes from year to year. As you mentioned, the average step scores are pretty much on point as far as you know what we look for in applicants. Though as time goes on, this was published last year in July 2020. I would say this application season was more a lot more competitive than has been in many years. And uh, I was looking at the stats from the National Residency Match Program, NRMP, for this year, and it looks like there were only three unfilled spots for anesthesiology. So I'll give you the breakdown. So the number of positions available were 1460, and then the number of filled were 1457, as compared to dermatology with zero unmatched positions, and family medicine with 351 unmatched positions, and with emergency medicine that had 14 unmatched positions. So the competitive Competitiveness of each specialty really does fluctuate from year to year, and in this particular cycle, anesthesiology was a little bit higher up on that list. Of the rigor of anesthesiology residency, it's generally more laid back with predictable hours and generally 55 to 65 hour work weeks, which is on the lower end compared to many other specialties. And as an attending, 40 to 50 hours a week is the norm. So I just wanted to pause there to comment on the residency hour demands and also the work life demands. So most people do consider, I would agree with him, most people do consider anesthesiology residency more laid back because our hours are more predictable. I would compare that directly to surgery. So as a surgery resident, you do have pretty structured hours, but they can fluctuate depending on the demands of the OR and the caseload for that day. So you may have to stay a little later and you definitely have to come in quite earlier to fulfill your duties as a surgery resident. As far as the work weeks, that's pretty accurate. A resident should expect to work anywhere between 55 up to 65 ish hours per week that's correct and the work-life balance is there so if you're not on call and you're a resident you should be expecting to get out of the or at a certain time to have very structured ways of relieving people in anesthesiology to make sure that we don't have overwhelming fatigue because again you have to be very attentive and very vigilant throughout the course of your day and if you're not able to because you're tired that's a patient safety issue so that's why it's really structured that's why this specialty requires you to be you know really well rested in order to function at your best because any slip, any mistake, any lapse of attentiveness can really have serious consequences. So that's part of the, the package and a lot of people wonder, you know, like, oh, how, why do you guys get out so early or why do you get lunch breaks? Why do, you, why do people give you breaks here and there? It's because you really need to be watching fully attentively throughout the entire course of the procedure and you need to be able to do that without distraction so that's part of the job and that can be taxing i think of it like you know if you have a cat that's like running around all day long they need naps right in order to maintain that energy so you need to be well rested in order to keep the energy of vigilance up throughout the entire case that's that and then attending life is pretty accurate you do for me for a specific example i do work about 50 hours a week um, and if I do extra call that may add up 
to maybe an additional five to 10 hours per week. So it just depends. In other scenarios, you may be working a little bit more if you're doing, um, you know, taking on more shifts, moonlighting, etc. So I would say the average attending work week is about 50 to 60 hours. Asia are more easygoing and understand the importance of work-life balance. But don't let the stereotypes confuse you. Anesthesiologists still work hard and have a great deal of pressure to perform and ensure patient safety. After anesthesiology residency, you So that I would say would be a great way to end my response to the video. The video does go on a little bit further to talk about the subspecialties of anesthesiology, which I mentioned um, a little bit earlier on. So not to uh, repeat that, but just to kind of like emphasize that last point that was made. So the characteristics of people who want to go into anesthesiology are really those of, you know, people who are very great with their hands. They're skilled with clinical procedures and people who are like really, attentive to detail, able to pick up on things quickly, able to respond quickly, are cool under pressure, and have really great judgment when it comes to, you know, making decisions in a short time frame with a lot of um, other things going on. So if you're able to multitask and you are a quick learner, someone who's great with procedures and doing things hands-on, then anesthesiology is probably going to be a good fit for you. You need to have an easygoing personality and also for sure be able to get along with others because your environment is going to be that of a team. So you're going to be working in a team environment every single day, whether you're working alone, um, providing the anesthesia, or if you're working with a resident as an attending, or you're working with the CRNA with attendings and other um, residents in the OR, you're going to be working on a team. Nurses in the OR, everyone's working together and we have to be able to communicate and get along. So if you're a person who feels most comfortable in that scenario and you are able to fulfill all those other qualities, then anesthesiology is probably going to be a good fit for you. So I would highly consider it if you're a med student, um, do some rotations in anesthesia, figure out if this really works for you in a practical sense. And if so, go for it. We'll be happy to have you on our team. So with all that, thank you guys for watching. Please do not forget to like. Hit that like button so that this video can be promoted so others can see it and learn from it as well. And also don't forget to subscribe and check out my Instagram, 3Anesthesia and Me. Thank you so much for watching and take care.